Are you ready? See you, Brad. It's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. We're halfway through the Flames' longest road trip of the season, three games into the six-game road trip, and we've had mixed results so far. We saw quite a blowout in Detroit and some better games after that. As always, I'm Dan alongside Matt, and we're here to break it down for you. Matt, let's start with that horrendous game in Detroit. And Before we do, let's set the scene in net. Mike Smith did not play in this game. Um, I think this was NHL concussion protocol. He still wasn't ready to come back after the St. Louis game. So Eddie Lack got the start in this game with John Gillies sitting on the bench. And before we get into the game, I'll ask you this. When you saw that Lack was starting, did you think Gillies would get any time in the net? I did not think that unless something went horrifically wrong that Gillies would play. Well, that's it. It's like you don't want Gillies to play because that means something's gone wrong. It's exactly like what happened with Vegas with Legacy in that they didn't want to play the 19-year-old kid. But unfortunately, he got hurt too. So what do you do? And it's one of those situations that you'd rather have the main guy who's going to be your backup goaltender be successful. And unfortunately, that was not the case in that game. In case of emergency, break glass, call up Gillies. Yes, exactly. Well, let's talk about this game. Um, Not a lot to talk about from the Flames side. We got blown out 8-2 to by the Detroit Red Wings. And this was a game I thought... You know what, this was Eddie Lack's chance to shine. I'm not saying it's all his fault, but this was his chance to stand on his head and show what he could do as a Flames goaltender. And I thought, if anything, this was... I know a lot of people give Eddie Lack a hard time this year here in Calgary, but I thought this was Eddie Lack's chance to shine and he didn't take it. Exactly. And he he could have had a Chad Johnson moment with the Flames last season where... Elliot struggled, Johnson got an opportunity, and then just was playing in God mode for the for the next, like, three weeks. I think even here, just showing he was a capable goaltender would have been enough. Yeah, and that's exactly it. Like, as long as he was showing that he was a viable NHL goaltender, then, hey, that's fine. At this point, I'm not really sold on Eddie Lack anymore. And, like, I think that, like, he should get another opportunity because every time, everybody has a bad game. So, you know, you can always write that one off. You give him another shot, and if he struggles in that one, then I think it's time that you look at uh, swapping Lack for one of the kids in Stockton. Did you see the tongue twister that I posted under the Fireside Chat Twitter account this week? What Eddie Lack lacks is a lack of starts. Will Eddie Lack start in Philly, or will the Flames lack Lack in net? I'm not going to say that three times fast. (laughs) <laughs> I, I think what the issue is here is Eddie Lack just hasn't started enough. You know, he's had, what, two starts all season. Yeah, and one relief appearance. Yeah, and I think that, you know, yeah, he's not looking great, but I think if you look around the league at a lot of goaltenders who have played 20, 30 games a year and then go to starting, you know, two in the first 20, you're going to find similar struggles. Yeah, the Curtis McElhinney special. Yeah, what they need to do here is get Eddie Lack some starts. And even if that means swapping him and, say, Gillies for a week of send Lack to the A to get some starts, I just think right now Eddie Lack's problem is his lack of starts. I agree. And unfortunately, the Flames are not in a position at the moment, especially with the type of teams that they're facing, that you can rely on Lack in net. Like, realistically, Detroit was probably the easiest of the six games on the road trip. And five goals against in, like, two periods. Yeah, it's, I don't know, and we'll talk more about the goaltending later in the show, but I don't know what we're going to do with the division of labor and net. No, it's like Kiprasov on steroids (laughs) at the moment. But frankly, even though the Flames have played 20 games, most of the games have been spread out enough where there hasn't really been a necessity like it's not like the flames have played like five back-to-backs and you know you're just throwing smith out there for everything we saw john gillies come into the net and played 34 minutes and 53 seconds in this game i thought gillies looked really good everything you know considered go in this game what did you think of john gillies appearance the one goal in the second period it Not much you can do. And then the two late goals to make it 8-2, it's on the power play. So, and by then the Flames hadn't really 
been, you know, they, they look like they were just wanting to get home. <laughs> Watch it. The whole team kind of gave up at that point. I can't blame them. They're probably scared for their lives at that point. That whole brawl situation, you just want to, you know, not screw up anything else. So just get through the last five minutes and go. And unfortunately, two more went in. I don't really blame him on those. Gillies looks solid, just like he did last year in his one start. And, uh, like, I, I'm looking forward to him getting more of an opportunity in the NHL. I don't know to what extent he will be an NHL player yet, whether he'll emerge as a starting goaltender or if he'll just be a high-quality backup. But it's getting to the point where you need to see what you have with him. And Well, and Eddie Lack on a one-year deal, I think, was a good a good deal for the Flames. It gave them that flexibility of, okay, we can put Gillies in the minors for another year, which I think he probably needs. Um, but it also, I mean, I think Carolina's absorbing half the salary on Eddie Lack. So if it comes to the point where Gillies outplays him, you can wave Lack, hopefully send him to the AHL. And if nothing else, there's a veteran backup for uh, Riddich. Yeah, and realistically, at $1.3 million, that's all we're paying Lack. You know, that's not a big deal. It's not like you're bearing $4 million or $5 million in Stockton, so it's negligible. I don't think Lack gets re-signed here. I think next year is the year you have to bring up one of the young goaltenders. It's too early for Parsons, but I think either Riddich or Gillies has to be brought up next year. Yeah, and that's why I wouldn't be surprised if Gillies gets a recall sooner than later. Um, just because of the fact that uh, it makes Riddich the guy and Stockton and sort of like the next guy on the totem pole instead of splitting the duties between them. I know we're all excited about uh, Tyler Parsons, but I don't think you play, you know, one year pro and then jump into a backup spot. That's not the best place for him to be. I think the best place for Parsons for the next couple of years is getting starting minutes in either the ECHL or the AHL. Put it this way, the only way that Parsons makes the NHL in the next, like, three years is if he is basically posting, like, a 1.5 goals against average in Stockton for, like, three months. In which case, like, you have to bring him up because, you know, it, it's just like with Jankowski earlier in the season. He was just clearly better for that league, so bring him up because he's just wasting time down there. But it's one of those situations that he'll have to do that in order to rush the development. Goaltending to me is a bit different, though, because with Jankowski, you bring him up to the NHL, you play him in the bottom six, he's still getting good minutes. If you bring Parsons up and sit him on the bench... He's still not getting good minutes, and I think there's a more of a case to be made for sometimes goalies say, you're too good for this league, we're going to leave you there just to play. Well, what I'm expecting is after Mike Smith's contract is over, that the goaltenders will be Gillies and Parsons, and they'll both basically be like Anderson and Gibson and Anaheim, where they're both playing like 40-ish games. That's what my kind of expectations are. And then just basically like when the playoffs come, go with whichever guy's better at the time. Well, we're trying to gloss over this bad game, but I will mention here, if you look at the box score on the Flames website, it's kind of funny. I had to scroll four times to read through all the penalties in the third period. I believe there's 23 penalties that were issued in that third period. Eh, just a minor brouhaha. No big deal. Just a scuffle. If you remember last big scuffle, it was, what, two years ago in uh, in Vancouver when they had the big line brawl off the faceoff, and that really mm. ignited the flames. I think that the team had a little bit of emotion in that game for a change because, like, they were getting thumped, and they got pissed off because of it. And it's never a bad thing to have the players being more mentally engaged in the game. Glenn Gullitson was saying that he liked seeing the emotion in the game. And it's necessary. And I think that as the Flames move forward, this might be a galvanizing thing where, like, to get everybody in a all-for-one, one-for-all mindset so that way they can work better as a team. We saw how the Flames were able to rebound from this when they went to Philadelphia to play the Flyers. It's weird to think, but Sean Monahan got his first NHL hat trick. He had four points, and Frolik scored in overtime to complete the Flames' comeback with a 5-4 overtime win against Philly. In this one, I really thought early on the Flames didn't play all that well, and I give them a lot of credit for coming back and taking over that this game. one legitimately caught me off guard. 
because of how good of a goal scorer Sean Monahan was. Like, I already assumed that he had, like, three or four hat-tricks at this point. You know, um, to hear that was his first. He had nine career two-goal games. He just never had gotten the third one until that game against Philly. And The curse of playing with Johnny, I guess. You greedy son of a... <laughs> Well, but I'm, I mean, he doesn't have three goal games, but Monahan's also become more of the setup man. So I'd wonder how many, let's say, three or four point games he's had. Tons. Right? I mean, that's why I'm not... It's kind of weird to think of, but that's why I'm not too surprised by it. Because he's really become more of the, the playmaker on that line. Michael Forley scored a minute 18 into overtime. I wasn't even ready for the game to end yet. I was, you know, hardly sitting down. But I like this one. It was kind of that... Um, you know, Froelich beating Elliot and the Flames thumping their old goaltender. I thought that was kind of funny. When uh, overtime started, the person I was watching the game with, I said to him, as soon as the Flames get possession of the puck, the game's over. And, like, for the first minute and a half, the Flyers held on to the puck. And then when they turned it over, I said, here you go. And then... Like, not even 10 seconds later, the game's over. Calgary is just absolutely lethal when it comes to three-on-three. Three. It's uh, amazing to see, especially after all those years of the Flames, frankly, struggling in overtime, to uh, see them being basically the best team in the NHL once you hit overtime. There's a GM meeting this week. Maybe Trey Living should pitch. The home team gets to pick how many players are on the yeah, ice. Yeah, I don't think that'd fly. Play the whole game three-on-three. The Oilers would be in favor of that because, you know. They've only got three. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Everyone else yeah, can go home. You guys all suck. You know, they'll just keep McDavid and, you know, find some warm bodies to go with them. They'll play two other centermen there. Yep. <laughs> I thought it was a good hockey game. It was fun to see the Flames battle back. I mean, we saw the Manning goal. Johnny tied it. The, uh, you know, the Philly goals came after that and it became three to one. Calgary came back and tied those. Like it was just enough back to back action that I thought it kept things really interesting. And even as a Flames fan, I never felt like the Flames were down and out in this one. No, and even in the with the three early goals by Philadelphia, it seemed like bad luck more so than like two of those shots were just weird seeing eye shots. Like those are not typical NHL goals it just unfortunately found a way in like when stuff like that happens as long as like the team doesn't fall apart after that which to the Flames credit they didn't you could start to see that okay now the tide's going the other way and once uh Monaghan scored in the second period you could kind of tell that the game was heading in that general direction and good on them for having the gutsy performance to get back and win it. The whole time I was watching, I was wondering if Mike Smith was really 100% or if they rushed him back in the net after what we saw from Eddie Lack the game before. We didn't see him stand on his head like usual, but I'm still not sure if Smith was 100% here. What do you think? No, he looked a little banged up, but honestly, I think he had a small handful of miscellaneous injuries from the three games before he got pulled. I think you're just seeing that like he was still battling some of the pain from all of those various bumps and bruises. Well, after this game, the Calgary Flames had to go to the U.S. Capitol, to Washington, and you might think that they would probably take a plane there. No, they chartered a train. As weird as that sounds, they chartered their own train to Washington, and the players decided to have a little fun. They thought, if we're going to travel by train, let's all dress in our best 50s attire. And you can go to the Calgary Flames website and see the video of all the guys in their 50s attire. I think the best one is um, Matthew Kachuk, who didn't play, wearing it out of the arena. It makes me wonder if he was wearing that all night in the press box. Probably was. Uh, you know, if you got style, you might as well roll with it, you know. We saw Mike Smith with a with a big pipe. Oh, yeah. It's good to see everybody having fun. I personally wish that uh, more people dressed like that on a regular basis and it became more of a normal thing. But Matt, you can start the trend. I already do. No, uh, <laughs> not always. But yes, I do wear attire somewhat similar to that. Not as old-timey, though. It's those little things that 
you know, really help the team with the bonding. I mean, in the picture, you'll see even the coaches were doing it. Um, Ryan Leslie was dressed that way. So it wasn't just the players. It was a big bonding experience. And it looked like everyone had a lot of fun. And not only did they dress that way, tried to make it as retro as possible. They actually said no cell phones or tablets on the train. So they were trying to unplug a little bit and I guess, you know, talk more to the to each other. And there's a big game of cards going on. So that sounds like a lot of fun. And you often see in these early season road trips, that's when teams really get bonding and get their chemistry together. And I think this could be one of those moments we might look back at and say the old timey train ride really helped the flames. Yeah. Plus, uh, you know, it provides a lot of Photoshop opportunities for flames fans out there. You you wonder, I mean, some of these young guys, it's so far removed and they, you know, we see, I mean, they're supposed to dress fifties and we see stuff in the thirties and the twenties, the pocket watches and that you wonder if Yager had some of the stuff already in his closet. He was about a, he was about a teenager at that time, wasn't he? It's still a little before his time. Well, they took that train ride to Washington. They got to Washington. They changed into their game attire and they played against the Washington Capitals, a team that the Flames performed pretty well against earlier this season. And in this game against Washington, the Flames have now won their season series 2-0 and by beating the Washington Capitals 4-1. to I thought the Flames started this one out not too bad. They looked a little sluggish in the first, I'd say, first period. And then it was the second period where the Flames were able to keep the Capitals on their heels. And I think the big story of this game for me was I think the Flames won because of their special teams. Well, not only that, I think the first uh, five minutes when... Uh, after Washington had their first power play, I think that's when the Flames just turned... Woke up. Yeah, they woke up. They turned the dial on at full blast, and they just ran with it all game. And Washington's a very good team. It, they're not as good as they were this season, at least. But, you know, Braden Holtby is still a top-notch goaltender. They still have Ovechkin, Kuznetsov, and all the other dangerous weapons on the team. So the fact that the Flames not only controlled the game, but basically kicked the ever-loving crap out of them. It was one of the single best games I've seen from the Flames, period. That's how complete of an effort it was, especially against an elite team like Washington. So the fact that they're able to do things like that, and like of the top 10 teams in the NHL, the games that the Flames have actually played against those teams, the Flames are now 6-1 and one with only the single loss to St. Louis out of that whole bunch. So it's showing that Calgary not only can be an elite team, but can beat the elite teams. And it, frankly, Washington had no response for uh, Calgary once they started going. It, it, it was just line after line after line, and the Capitals couldn't get any sustained momentum. Like, they might get a good shift here and there, but that was it. You know, and I think, I don't know about you, the Flames surprised me earlier in the season when they beat the Capitals handedly, and I wasn't expecting it again. So this was a bit of a pleasant surprise, seeing how the Flames were able to keep the Caps on their heels. Yeah, uh, I was surprised the first time as well, especially with how well they did in that game. But then to have, frankly, a better performance tonight, or last night, that it was just surprising. And I'm glad to see that they're able to do that. And frankly, for Calgary to emerge as an elite team in this league they need to be able to go up against the other exceptional teams and do exactly that and just absolutely shut them down and skate away with the w what came to my mind when i saw the flames win this one was the catchphrase of the great rick flair to be the man you gotta beat the man And I think that's really what this game was to me. It's that the Capitals are still looked at as an elite team in the NHL, and we were able to beat them handedly. And it's like, okay, if we can beat the Capitals, that should give you the motivation you need going forward. Yeah, and frankly, the Flames just need to continue playing as they have been when they're not getting blown out by Detroit. (laughs) You know, if you look back at any team, though, everybody's got one or two blowouts every season. Oh, yeah, for sure. I think Pittsburgh lost a game last year 10 nothing. I think it was to Montreal. So, you know, it happens. So, like, that doesn't mean anything. It's how you bounce back. 
Like, if you're giving up those on a regular basis, then maybe you have some issues. A couple of interesting stats coming out of this game. Uh, the Flames are now 7-0-0 this season when leading after two periods of play. So anytime that they've been up um, in the game after two periods, after the 40-minute mark, they've won that game. And this is now 40 consecutive victories spanning all the way back through last year for the Flames when they've led after 40. So if we can if we can get up after the second period, we're probably going to win the game. That's the moral of the story here. Anything else about this road trip so far you want to discuss before we move on? Well, I just want to uh, remark on the excellent play of both Sean Monaghan and Johnny Gaudreau, just because of the fact that they're doing so amazingly well. Um, Gaudreau's now up to a third in the league in scoring and only a couple points behind the leaders, and Sean Monaghan has 12 goals already and only one behind Ovechkin and I think five or six behind Nikita Kucherov. If we're going to talk about those guys, we can't leave Furland out either. I mean, he's not a first-line right winger, but he blends really well on that line. I agree, and he's playing the part of a first-line right winger rather effectively, even though, you know... It, I think I honestly think he's probably good enough for this year. We might be able to you know steal a year out of him. We'll see. It, that's the problem with potential. You just don't know what a player's level is going to be in any given year. And Furlan didn't get started playing hockey until rather late. I think he was 16 when he started. What his ceiling is still is up in the air. Well, and if nothing else, and I know I'm going to get some hate mail for this or hate tweets, but if nothing else, I think after a season like he's playing now, he may have a higher market value then, you know, it might be worth almost moving him for a higher market value than just keeping him around. Nah, you always need guys like that in the playoffs. Yeah, I think that there's others in the organization who could play that role. So if we move away from the Calgary Flames on the ice, there was an interesting story that came out. Flames GM Brad Treliving was scouting. He was in the press box scouting the last two Buffalo Sabres games two in a row and generally you're not going to be scouting the same team twice unless either you've got a lot of games coming up against them and even then the gm doesn't usually go so it probably means and nobody goes to a vacation to buffalo so you know it can't be that (laughs) well were they both home games i i'm not sure i think they were so so there's one of two options he's either looking at chad johnson regretting getting rid of him or maybe he's looking to doing a trade with buffalo yeah and i could see that uh, there's not a lot of pieces though on the sabers that make sense for buffalo to trade them like it, their top center is jack eichel he's not going anywhere and realistically rasmus rustalainen he's uh their number one defenseman and unless like the flames are trading dougie hamilton for him and then adding something and even at that rate why it seem would seem like a pointless trade can you see any players on the buffalo team who you could see or work out in your head a deal the there's two that would make sense if the flames included troy brower in the trade and that those are kyle ocposo and jason pominville both have a lot of years left on their contract and are more expensive players both are right wingers Yes, and that's exactly it. I don't see them moving either player. Like It would take a fairly good prospect swap to acquire either of those guys. I'm not sure if it's really in the Flames' best interest to do that right now. Uh, I, I think that there are probably better options that won't cost as much in terms of cap hit. Well, this is the thing. Anytime somebody this year talks to me about we should make this trade or we should bring in this guy, my first thing is, what pieces do you move? Like right now, I'm not seeing a lot of pieces. I want the Flames to move. I don't think we start mortgaging our prospects yet. We've got some great prospects there. And I mean, yeah, we all want to get rid of Brower and get rid of Stajan. But if that was easy to do, the Flames would have done it. Like Nobody wants to take those on without being compensated for it. So my question is, what pieces are we comfortable giving up? I know, and the one scenario that I've seen is the swap of the Sams, uh, Bennett for Reinhardt. Realistically, that 
does make some sense in the fact that Sam Bennett's a left shooting center slash winger, left winger, and Sam Reinhardt is a right shooting center slash right winger. So, like, organizationally, because, like, we have Andrew Mangiapane, who could probably just slot into Bennett's spot on the third line, it's a conceivable fix. I think it's also two guys that might need a bit of a change of scenery. It's just one of those situations where is that fit of a player better or not? And, like, Bennett's very much an in-your-face style of player, uh, where uh, Reinhardt's more of a defensively-oriented cerebral player. More of a Monaghan type. Yeah, I don't know. It's tough because, like, especially in the playoffs, you need to have that physicality. But, I mean, if you look, let's just look at this year's playoffs. If the Flames want physicality, they've got Glass, they've got Gadzig, they've got Hathaway. Like, I think at least this year. Yeah, and you Furland, could... Brower, even uh, a bunch of the defensemen. Yeah, like, they can do it. It's just one of those, like, uh, would the Flames be going a little too much into the finesse? side of things if they made that deal like i can understand like it 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 would probably end up being a better trade for in terms of value if the flames were to do that it's just it's always tough when you're trading a good player like bennett for another good player well that's it i mean and and we get attached to our own players yeah you're reticent to like oh let's ship that guy out for you know That's where it's like a legitimate hockey deal where good player for good player. It's just you don't want to lose that good player that's on your team. It's a lot of like what Ottawa Senators fans are going through with uh, the Tourists and DeShane trade. Yeah, you got DeShane, but oh, you lost Tourists. Well, but to me, those are the best deals because as fans, yeah, you're sad to see somebody go, but at the same time, you're really excited to see somebody come in. True. Like, uh, honestly, I could see Reinhardt fitting in on the Flames' first line, even. It's just tough, you know, because you don't want to see somebody that you, you've been following since you you drafted them to get moved. But see, I mean, this is, and, and this is a bigger discussion for another day, but this is part of the thing about being homers, right? Is we get attached to these guys. And even, I mean, if you look, we get attached to guys that aren't very good. Like, look at the enforcers, right? We all love McGratton. Like, we, we get attached to some of the weirdest guys in the team. And sometimes it's harder to move them or it feels harder to move them because we're so attached to them when really it's like, yeah, the guy's not actually that good. Frankly, I can understand why, you know, a trade of Sam Bennett would make sense because he has been struggling and he, you know, and same with Sam Reinhardt, he's been struggling in Buffalo and it could end up like if that trade were to happen, it could very well be that Reinhardt fits in better here and Bennett fits in better in Buffalo. It's just always tough on deals like that, but I'm sure the both Predator and Blue Jackets fans were having similar feelings in terms of the jones johansson trade too so you know because you're losing a good player but you're getting a good one just say it's tough you know one of the interesting names on this team and i thought i'd throw by you one guy i think who is definitely going to be in play and might get one of the biggest packages if he's still available on trade deadline day is evander kane what would you think? He's got a one-year deal so it doesn't have to be a long-term thing but what would you think if the flames were to say move Bennett and something to get Evander Kane. I frankly would not trade Troy Brower one for one. Wow. I do not like his attitude at all, and I don't like players that have a bad attitude unless they are superstar caliber players. Like you can have a dick if the guy is like Patrick Kane level good, then you just put up with it. Evander Kane's not that good. Are we also seeing Kane maturing, though, as he's getting older? Unless you get him for a bargain, I still... You know, he's a good player. I'm not knocking that. It's just there are other... You know, unless you're getting him for a song... Wouldn't Brower for Kane be a song? I really would not want Evander Kane on the Flames at all. I think if Kane had a long-term deal, I might think differently of it on a one-year deal. I think I would be a lot more open to it. I mean, I understand what you're saying, and being, especially being a Calgary Flame, the community is so important to you. I think in some ways it might 
it might be interesting to see how Kane works in that stance in one season and say, okay, can he shape up and be a good face of the community and, you know, pull his socks up or he's going to be out of here next season. And frankly, like there are other options available that don't have that headache problem of attitude and like, is the guy mature enough? Yeah, I don't know. I, I think if you're playing on a Brian Burke team, you're not going to get away with a lot of the crap Kane's got away with. Like, I just don't see that being a reasonable fit. Reinhardt, sure, I could see that quite easily. Ocposo, Pominville, sure. I don't see the need to go and get Ryan O'Reilly, even though he's a top-notch player himself. Uh, I would like to see Ocposo. My issue with Ocposo is I don't know what package we put together to get him. Like, I think just the acquisition cost of Ocposo is going to be too high. Yeah. Palmonville, I can see. I can see doing even doing something like Bennett for for Palmville and Pick instead of getting Reinhardt. I could see that working out. Ocposo is just going to cost way too much. When I look at what would I be willing to give up for Ocposo, it's nothing that the other team's going to want. No. And, like... You know, the Flames do have the ability to trade a whole bunch of prospects because the Flames do ha- are deep at all positions. It's just you don't want to start dwindling that unless you need to. Well, my worry with doing that too is, you know, I mean, we've seen Tree Living moving a lot of picks lately. And I think as we become more of a contender, he's going to do more of that. So I think that usually I'd say, yeah, move some prospects and we'll replenish the cupboards with picks. But I worry that we don't have that's not going to happen. Yeah. We don't have any picks. I mean, even this year, look at the players. I mean, nothing against them, but look at the caliber of players the Flames drafted this year. It wasn't a great draft year for the Flames. So I think if we start moving out a lot of, you know, let's call them A level prospects, they're not going to get replaced. No, and like it, frankly, the Flames are going to need to start shipping out players like Brower, like Froelich in the coming seasons and like you're going to need high quality young guys to come in and actually replace them with some credibility and right now you know you don't want to be getting rid of the Manjapanis and the Andersons the Shillingtons without having replacements for those guys well, and without giving them, I think, a proper look. Like, you know, if you would have looked at Jankowski two years ago, I think people would have said, well, he is not progressing the way maybe we want him to. Maybe he's good to be shipped out. And, you know, people said that about Backlund for a while, too. Oh, we should ship him out. I think we need to give these guys a chance and let them... Ch- I mean, I wouldn't have expected Mangiapane to do as well as he is in his rookie year. So I think, sons, you've got to actually let these guys get on the roster to see what you got in them. Looking at the the Buffalo salary caps, though, Ocposo's 29, and he has a six-year deal at $6 million. Pretty reasonable for a top-line right winger. And Jason Pominville's $5.6 million for two years. He's 34. One of the reasons I like the idea of Pominville coming in is because he gives us that immediate veteran presence, especially with such a young lineup. The downside to both Ocposo and Pominville is... Uh, Ocposo has a no movement, and Palmonville has a modified no movement. So that could be why there's a delay in this, is trying to get one of them to to allow the move. Yeah, I think those are both interesting choices there. The other nice thing about uh, if they were to bring in... I mean, Buffalo, if you look at their roster, they're, they've actually got... They're doing pretty well cap-wise. Yeah. They don't have a lot of really expensive guys. Even Reinhardt is making less than a million, and he's an RFA. So you bring him in, you qualify him right away. You're not going to lose him next year. The only player I can see, let's say of the top six, the Flames moving this year, and I'm not saying they will, but if they can't get a deal, I think they have to move Backlund as opposed to lose him as a UFA. And I think that could be interesting later on down the road. And we'll talk about that as we get close to the deadline. But I think that could be a big hockey deal for the Flames. And I don't see that happening whatsoever. No, I think he'll resign here, but if for some reason he doesn't want to, you can't let him walk. No. And as much as he's an important part of this team, I think you've got to, at some point, if he's not going to sign, move him. We were talking about some of the good young players in the Flames system. They added one more this week as the Flames signed center Glenn Godden to a three-year entry-level contract. Godden was an unsigned pick of the St. Louis Blues. We saw him this year at the Flames Rookie Development Camp in July. Uh, He's from Richmond, B.C., and he was drafted fourth round, 116th overall in 2015. He's 20 years old, 
and captaining the Swift Current Broncos right now. And this kid's having a hell of a season. He's got just over, uh, when he was signed, he had 14 goals and 40 points in 18 games with the Broncos. Eh, okay. That's rather pedestrian, you know. Well, at the WHL, you're getting better in a point a game in the first 18. That's crazy. Yeah, true enough. When we saw him both in for the Penticton games and in uh, July, he was just a very smart player. His offensive upside, he's not top six material, but he's just a very smart player. And smart players tend to do well in juniors. Whether he, as he transitions into the AHL next year, we'll see. I, I'm not sure that uh, like he'll be much better of a player than, say, Garnett Hathaway. But that said, any player that you can get that has NHL potential and you get them for free, awesome. Looking at sort of those young players, I personally think Godden may have more upside than Spencer Fu. I don't. No? I think Godden is going to be a guy who could make your bottom six and stay there for a number of years. Yeah, so same here. But but I don't think Spencer Fu is necessarily going to be a top six guy. I think that Spencer Fu might be one of these guys that goes up and down from the A. You know, plays a little bit, goes down, plays a little bit, goes down. Almost like a Freddie Hamilton type. Where I can see Godden being a guy who, if he can cement himself as a good defensive centerman, could get full-time work. Yeah, I think that like if Fu makes it, it'll be a top nine forward. If he doesn't, then he won't be in the NHL, where if Godin makes it, he'll be a fourth-line player and will stick there. Could be a cheaper option than Matt Stajan. There is a number of cheaper options out there than Matt Stajan. I think any fourth-line center is cheaper than Matt Stajan. Stajan's actually been sitting in the press box for most of this trip. You know, it's unfortunate. I like Matt Stajan, but unfortunately, when you have a team like Calgary, you have too many good players and... It's just a numbers game. It's a good problem to have. Yeah. I think uh, he'll be spending more time in the press box. Honestly, I think that Stajan could probably play still on probably two-thirds of the teams in the NHL on a regular basis. It's just, unfortunately, Calgary's not one. But, you know, if you look at a forward who can step in in an injury, like when we had, you know, the suspension earlier this week, you feel comfortable enough with Stajan stepping in. It's not like we're handing the reins over to somebody unknown. I feel like, okay, if he's the 13th forward, I'm pretty comfortable with that. Definitely. As you said, he's good enough to play on a lot of teams. I still think that if there is a move, that's a piece that could be in play. Yeah, and I think at the trade deadline, you know, there's always teams that are wanting guys like that, so it's possible. Easy way to recover a pick. Yep. Another Flames prospect that we should talk about who had a rough start to the season but has turned things around recently, Tyler Parsons was named the ECHL Player of the Week, and he's had four wins in a row, and I think you said one shutout in those four wins? Yeah, the last game he got a shutout. So he's starting to come around in the E. I think, as as we see for a lot of guys, there's a transition from junior hockey to pro hockey. Probably a bit of a transition from junior hockey to the ECHL too, which is probably a bush league even compared to the way that the Canadian uh, junior leagues are run. So it sounds like Parsons is finally getting comfortable there and doing well, and we'll see if that continues. But I'm going to be really curious going forward to see how that time between Parsons and McDonald is split up. Same here. Um, I think it'll probably be two-thirds, one-third. And as much as we talked earlier about prospects that, you know, we don't want to move, as much as I think it's great to have as many goalie prospects as we do, I think if there's a prospect you might see thrown into something, it could be Mason McDonald. I agree. I just think that looking at the defensive depth, he might be the one that's expendable right now. You don't trade him just to trade him, but if you need an extra piece in a deal, I think he's the easy prospect to move. Well, Matt, with that, the Calgary Flames are now one quarter of the way through their season, and we've been seeing some ups and some downs from this team this year. They started out not looking too great. I mean, we were wondering early on if this team might be a bit of a bust, and then we've seen them coming around lately and playing a lot better. They've had streaks of times when they've looked like a Stanley Cup team and streaks of times when they haven't. As of the time we record this, the Flames are currently sitting third in the Pacific Division at 24 points. 12 wins, 8 losses, and 0 overtime losses. 20 games in, what are your impressions of this team? 
I am frankly shocked that the Las Vegas Golden Knights are one of the two teams that are ahead of Calgary. <laughs> Cause We're talking about the Flames here, Matt. I know. I just... That is like the most absurd thing i've ever seen so that's... is that a testament to how good the golden knights are or how bad the pacific division is a little bit of a and a little bit of b but uh anyhow um the flames are roughly right around where i was expecting them to be right at the top of the division uh, in the within two points like we're two points back have a game in hand so no big deal they're doing basically what I was kind of expecting. They usually ha- struggle out of the gate, and that's just due to, you know, seems like Calgary just being Calgary. Uh, for it's the our last, thing. Yeah, it, October sucks. So the fact that they got through that and now are 12-8. and eight. We've had some years we've sucked to Christmas, though, and I think right now the Flames have shaken it off early, which is good. Yeah, and like you're starting to see the third and fourth line and the, third, the second and third defense pairing both playing more like they were expected to. And uh, Brett Kulak has emerged, I think, as a quality defenseman in his own right. I think the Flames are trending towards like now it from like here on out like we're going up to the top and we're going to stay there in the our division i think that uh, the team is starting to get on that role and understanding what it takes to be a contender and i think that especially if the second and third lines can take some of the def- the offensive responsibilities it like when Gaudreau and Monaghan cool down because I don't expect Gaudreau to put up 130 points this year for some reason uh that you know it it'll help to keep the winds rolling even though the first line might not be performing as well but I think this team is not built to be anchored by that first line when i look at this team is built to have three at least strong lines oh i agree and i think and we've mentioned in the past i think the first line has done a good job of propping us up for the first 20 but now it's up to everyone else to make up the lost points and to start contributing there yeah and we've even seen that from the 3m line where well kachuk's done what he normally does but i think for leak and to a lesser extent backland have had a little bit of a rough start in terms of generating offense The third line has just been virtually non-existent. I also think that the 3M line, maybe some of that could be because Gulliton is using them, I think, to fill a lot of the defensive void that other people are leaving. Exactly. So I think, like, once everybody starts pulling in the same direction, like, you gotta figure the Flames are basically at the top of the division, and not everybody's on the same page yet. So once the team gets on the same page and where they're all doing things that they're supposed to be doing, then, you know, look out. It's just, you know, if they're starting to play more like that Washington game, that was the first time I've seen them this season where everybody was on the same page. And they thoroughly destroyed Washington. So if they can keep that up, we'll see. Just to put this in perspective, the Flames, as you mentioned, are third in the Pacific right now. They've played 20 games. The LA Kings are number one. We have a game in hand on them. They've played 21 games. They have 26 points and the Flames have 24. The best team in the West is St. Louis with 31. I don't think we're going to catch St. Louis this season, but I mean, with the point differential being Winnipeg as 27 and they're second in the West, I could see the Flames sneaking up there to be second or third in the entire conference. Frankly, what I'm expecting, uh, just based on how they played against each other, that the Western Conference Finals is going to be St. Louis versus Calgary, which that would be fun. Just one of those things that I think Calgary, especially, we haven't played too many games against our own division yet, and I think once we do get that opportunity... We'll rack up the points. Yeah, because like, I don't think we've played Arizona yet. Uh, we played Edmonton once. Uh, How many divisional games do we have? Six? Yeah, something like that. So that's like 12 guaranteed points against Arizona. Only played Anaheim once, San Jose I think once, LA once. Uh, once we're playing those teams more, we've not played Vegas yet at all. So 
I think once we start getting games against those teams, then we're going to start rocketing up. It's just the early season struggles. Like, if the Flames can continue playing well, they're going to win a lot of games. At the 20 game mark, what percentage certainty do you have the Flames will make the postseason? 100. What percent certainty do you have the Flames make a pass round one? Uh, Probably 80%. That's the stumper, right? We can't seem to make it past the first round. That's why I want them to win the division, because they'll have an easier time against whomever the wild card teams are. Vegas? I doubt it. Frankly, it'll probably be San Jose. I'm just watching Vegas, and it's like a stock market crash. I'm just waiting for that line just go woo, way down. <laughs> Basically. Every day I look at it going, okay, you have 12 wins. That's all the wins you're going to get. That's your 12 for the season. Now you're going to go on a, you know, however many games are left losing streak. Like, this has got to end somewhere. Oh, I know. Like, when their goalies keep dropping like flies, and yet they still are winning, it's like, uh, what's going on here? <laughs> So they have 19 games played so far. Do you think they now play the next 63 and go on a 63-game losing streak? Not that bad. All right, 60. I think they caught a lot of teams off guard. Well, I wonder if that's been part of it. They had a big home stand, and I wonder if teams just underestimated them. Well, you got to figure that, you know, there's probably the road teams were having some off-ice celebrations, and, you know, that may have affected how they played in those games. So as a GM, when do you, you know, rent a hotel outside of Vegas, store your players there, and then bust them in just for the game and bust them back? I think that's what, you know, if I was running a team, it would basically, we're going to practice in wherever the last city that we were playing in, and then the morning of, take the flight to <laughs> that city, and then play the game that night, and then go immediately. <laughs> Or you, you know those you know those rinks they sell Canadian tire you can put in your backyard just bring one set up in the middle of the desert practice on it and then deflate the thing <laughs> that'd be hilarious but no just set, set it up you got your equipment manager out there the hose just film the thing up so your team can practice <laughs> that that's bad I'm just looking at the schedule here like I don't think we play Vegas till December yeah or no January. January 30th is the first game against Vegas. Well, hopefully they got their crappiness going in full swing by the time we first play them. I think the big question for me is if the Flames can make it through the first round. And I think that's why, as you said, the impetus is there to be number one in the Pacific because it's going to make that job that much easier. Yeah, well, which would you rather play? A team that just barely squeaks in like say anybody but anaheim or playing anaheim or la in round one like well right now anaheim's in no wild card spots anaheim will probably be up with us in la very 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 soon they'll flip flop with vegas and then san jose will flip flop with vegas yeah and then everybody except for edmonton and Ana arizona will flip flop with vegas all right so while we're talking about the pacific division before i ask you the next question we all expected Arizona, Colorado to be the terrible teams this year. Gratification for Flames fans, Edmonton is doing worse than Colorado, and Vancouver is doing worse than Colorado. That's just music to my ears. You know, I can't complain. I didn't think that Edmonton would make the playoffs this year because they're just too top-heavy. I don't want to say who. One of the popular Flames media personalities, not one of the guys in this show, but someone you'll see on TV from time to time, thought Edmonton would win the Cup this year. I question anybody who thought Edmonton would win the Stanley Cup's credibility, honestly. You look at Stanley Cup champions, and e even the finalists, it's usually two deep teams. Calgary in 04 was an exception where we got in because of having the best player at the time and the best goalie at the time you know and then we didn't win the cup but you look at the other teams since then it's always been two of the deepest teams in the league getting to the finals so you're saying having chris russell's your best defenseman isn't going to get you there no and uh, you look at edmonton yeah connor mcdavid is great awesome but there's 20 guys on the team and well this is what i say to everybody is you know yes mcdavid's awesome but even in the 80s gretzky had a great supporting cast perfect example best player in nhl history gets traded to la la is not anywhere near of a deep of team as edmonton how many cups did gretzky win the rest of his career zero that's because you need a deep team and edmonton kept on winning cups after they won the cup in 1990 without gretzky because they were still a deep team one player doesn't make you awesome Crosby didn't win the Stanley Cup 
the first go around because he was just all that and then some the penguins were a legitimately stacked team and it's the same with all the teams that have won the cup like they're just deep and edmonton has two players that are good and a goalie that's not been having the best season well, that's a recipe for you're going to get a lot of points for those guys and the rest of the team's going to be crap. And unfortunately for Edmonton, that means that they're probably going to end up picking in the top eight again. The question is, do they know to pick a defenseman this time? Well, as long as the one thing that I am hoping beyond all hopes is that Brady Kachuk does not play for Arizona, Edmonton, Vancouver, or Las Vegas. That is my only concern. I do not want... I love Kachuk on our team, but he is such a pain in the ass. I don't want to have to see that six times a season. (laughs) Because they're the same guy, literally. I don't want to have to go up against that all the time. Go to the East. You know, anywhere in the East, awesome. Well, Matt, two more questions for you as we look at this team at the quarter post so far. Who do you think becomes a surprise for the rest of the season? Is there one player you think is either going to surprise us in a good way or a bad way? I think Sam Bennett will turn around. I think he's been surprising in a bad way, and I think he'll get his stuff together and rebound. Glenn Gullitson came into the season thinking Sam Bennett would be the player to watch this year. Well, he has been the player to watch. Uh, It's like, what are you doing? (laughs) I'm hoping that he just starts to turn things around and things start bouncing his way. My prediction, and this is a bit of a bold prediction, I think that you might see Bennett moved midseason in a hockey deal, something like the Reinhardt deal, and I think Jankowski could surplant him as the number three, legitimate number three, you know, prospect guy. I could see that. I think right now we've got some higher prospects on the depth chart. I think Bennett was a bit of the wild card there, and I think that Janko could, could make the Flames be comfortable making that move. But I'll agree with you. I think Bennett's going to come around. I think Janko's the other guy to watch. Who do you think disappoints for the rest of the year? I'm going to have to go with Michael Froelich. You're the one calling for the breakup of the 3M line. I don't know. He seems to be more of a passenger lately than... Whereas, like, last year he was an equal contributor. And I'm just not sure... You know, like, I'm sure that some people might be complaining about him by the end of the year. You think he might be the next... Ah, bad contract. Let's get him out of here. Well, that happened the first year he was here, so... But then he (laughs) proved himself. Yeah, true. I think coming into the season, I thought that Brower was going to be that guy. I've changed my mind on him now. I think he's a serviceable fourth-line guy. I think the two disappointments for me this year that we may end up seeing are going to be uh, Versteeg and Lazar. And I'm a big fan of Curtis Lazar's, but I'm just not seeing enough out of him so far. No. I think we're going to regret giving up a second-round pick. Yeah, I think Versteeg's playing a little better lately so i'm not sure i think he might have just been having a bad start to the year but i think he's playing better now but everyone else i think is playing about where i expect him to be the big question for me though is can the backup goaltender bounce back the flames have started mike smith in 18 of their 20 games so far matt how long can we continue to ride mike smith how many starts can this guy get and how many do we either have to have lack or somebody else step in for i mean we can't keep playing uh, smith in 18 of every 20 can we calgary's benefited just from an unusual schedule to start the year where been a lot of off time it's one of those situations where he's getting enough rest so you just naturally go with the guy just because of the fact that oh we've had two or three days off so might as well it's just uh Like, as the schedule gets a little more condensed moving forward, the team needs to either let Lack play more or move Lack and let one of the other guys play more. I'm a little surprised with the goaltending issues we've seen at this point that Lack's still a flame. Not that I don't like him. I like Eddie Lack. I've said that coming in. I think he's just not played enough. But with the amount of teams, especially Vegas, Montreal, that have had goaltending issues, you got to think that Lack's a better choice, say, than Niemi. You got to think that, you know, somebody's probably made some calls saying, hey, this is a guy, at least we know we're getting there. But yeah, no, and if you look at the schedule, you're right. Scheduling-wise, December's still a pretty good month as far as the schedule goes. The Flames get a bunch of days off around Christmas. They got a couple two- and three-day breaks. But when we get into January, I mean, this team starts playing outside of their bye week. They're playing almost every other day, and 
February is going to be a tough month. Like there's one week in February where we play four games in seven days. Yeah, and realistically, we need a backup to play. And whether that's Lack or Gillies, we'll see. But it, especially in moving into the new year, the Flames will need somebody to play more because you can't realistically expect Smith to play 70 games this year. Like it, It's just not feasible. He needs to play about 60 to 65 in order to be fresh for the playoffs. Like it, You just can't do that. And that's our poll of the week. We want to know what you guys think. If you head over to firesidechat.ca or visit us on Facebook, we're facebook.com slash firesidechat or on Twitter, we're at firesidepodcast. We want to know in our poll of the week how many games you think Mike Smith is going to start this year. Do you think he'll start less than 50, 50 to 55, 55 to 60, 60 to 65, or do you think he's going to be looked at to start more than 70 games this year? So let us know what you think. We'll talk about that next week. Um, what everyone thinks, but I think I'm with you, Matt. I think 60 to 65 is where I'd like, where I think you'll play. I'd like if he get a bit more rest and play 55 to 60. Yeah. Just going through 18 of 20 though. I don't see how that's realistically feasible, but I I think the only way that happens if they bring in a backup, they're more confident with be that through trade, be that through promotion, whatever that might be. And maybe you see backups rotating through the year. Last week we asked, our fans about at the quarter mark, how confident are they that the flames made the playoffs? And you and I were both saying we're at about a hundred percent confidence. This team will make the postseason. The question becomes, do they make it past the first round? 54% of our respondents said, no doubt this team makes the playoffs. 45% said they they have a 50, 50 chance that the flames will be in the playoffs this season. And those are the only two responses that we got. Um, nobody thought they were going to miss. Nobody thought they'd sneak in and nobody thought the flames would be playing golf come May. Interesting. I thought that 50, 50 chance was so high. I didn't think we'd have that many fans thinking really that it's a, a toss of the coin. It's one of those things because of the flames starting the season so poorly. I can understand. That's their how we always start. I know, but that's exactly it. Like we always start a little iffy. Uh, so like, that's why like the flames being in the spot that they're in, like I'm thrilled because, like, two points out of first at this point, yay, awesome. <laughs> Definitely go vote on our poll. It'll be on Facebook, on Twitter, and on our website. And let us know how many starts you think Mike Smith is going to get. And we're curious to see kind of where everyone thinks he's going to land. And we'll look back at that at the end of the season and see how we did. Matt, with that, I think it's time to look ahead to the second half of this long road trip, the Flames' longest road trip of the year with six games played. We're halfway through. The Flames on the 22nd of November will play the Columbus Blue Jackets. It's a 5 p.m. start. The Flames on the 24th will play against the Dallas Stars in Dallas. And then uh, back-to-back against Colorado on the 25th. Before we talk about those three games, let's talk about that Colorado game. Team that's not doing too well, do you think that's where either Lack or some other goaltender besides Mike Smith will get a start here? Yeah, you would have to figure that you're going to likely see a backup plan because it's a back-to-back it's a back-to-back and a weak team. Yeah, that would be like your default pencil it in before the season starts backup plays here. Whether that happens or not, we'll see. So with three games on the register before the Flames come back to play the Maple Leafs on the 28th, how do you think we do? Calgary sucks in Columbus for some reason. Is this going to be the new Honda Center curse? It's not quite that bad. I I guess they're scared of the cannon there. I don't know. Um, they just struggle in Columbus and have for most of the Jackets' existence in that building. That, to me, is the most important game of the week just because of, you know, a similar story with the Anaheim Honda Center BS that, you know, you have to break the curses wherever you find them. And we struggle there, so I think that one's a very important game. I don't see us winning that one. I'm interested to see how Panarin's doing. I haven't watched any Jackets games this year. Uh, So I'll be interested to see how he's doing with the Jackets. And uh, I think the Flames are struggling against the Jackets, but I also think that they have a renewed probably sense of optimism after beating Washington 4-1. to I'm going to say the Flames take Dallas and Colorado, and I think that they may end up getting one point out of the Columbus game. Well, you know how it is. If the Flames make it to overtime, they're winning that. So might as well go for six for six. All right, I'll be bold. Six points. But an overtime win. 
An overtime win. I think that they're going to sneak out of Columbus. I think Dallas, they could win by a couple, and I think Colorado is going to be the one to watch, see how how well do we do. Is it a 4-1 to one win? Is it a reverse of the Detroit game, and it's like an 8-2? We'll see. I think it also depends who's in net and how that goalie's feeling that day. Worst case scenario is Eddie Lack goes in and we have another Detroit game where we lose 8-2 to two to a team we shouldn't be losing 8-2 to two to. And then bye-bye Eddie Lack and hello whomever. <laughs> if we end up losing that game because of Eddie Lack, I think Lack doesn't come home with the team. Like, you can't leave him in the arena. You can't, oh, look, a bird, and we all well, run away. But you know, we're not Florida, you know. We'll actually pay for the guy's cab. <laughs> Well, uh, let, let's be generous. Let's pay for the whole flight to Stockton, shall we? Yeah, true enough. But I think that's really going to be the proving point. I think you almost have to give Lack that game to let him prove himself after a bad Detroit game and say, all right, Eddie, you know, if you don't, if this one, if we lose it because it's the goalie's fault, you're going to Stockton. And in Toronto, we'll have a brand new backup when, you know, the Maple Leafs come to the Dome. Yep, I agree. So I think that could be a, an interesting turning point for the season on that one. So enjoy the Flames hockey this week and uh, get ready after the road trip for another homestand as we'll take on the Maple Leafs, the Arizona Coyotes, and the Edmonton Oilers. That should be a nice homestand for the Flames to pick up some points on as well. Have a good week, everybody. Thank you for listening. As always, go Flames go. We'll talk to you next week and see if we have a new goaltender. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.